Welcome to Wild Development Studio. Join us as we venture into the breathtaking realm of wildlife arts and untamed adventures. With captivating stories from the field and ideas to dive into the visual arts, we'll ignite your passion for conservation. Get ready to develop something wild. Welcome to Wild Developments. You're in the right place if you're looking for a heartfelt connection with nature through the visual arts and storytelling. With us today is Monica Irowski, travel expert for Yampu Tours, 25 years and counting, planning journeys of a lifetime to Mexico, Central and South America, Asia, Africa, India, Himalayas, Europe, Australia, and Antarctica. New York Times speaker and corporate trainer on travel, Monica's think outside the box attitude allows her to design a wealth of carefully crafted life enriching experiences, as well as special interests such as history and culture, adventure, spas, yoga, volunteer travel and give back, family fun, or a honeymoon. Hi, Monica. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi, Lauren. Thank you for inviting me on your show. I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm excited to talk to you and I got to dive right into my first question because I saw the answer already. What is your favorite experience in nature? Nature. I love nature. Every time I travel, I have another experience that is amazing. But the first thing that pops into my mind that really took my breath away was swimming with whale sharks in Baja, Mexico. Um, They, they, they are there and they're very calm and very still. They're eating plankton. They come once a year for several months. And um, the park there in Mexico, you never knew. I never knew it, but they're really good at protecting their uh, water and their animals that are in the water. So the boat goes up to the, the check man who makes sure there's not too many boats going in. And then you have a specialized biologist as a guide. and so. You, they give you a spot where you can go and put your snorkel on, go down. And um, my my mask was foggy. I, I messed it up, you know, because I just wanted to do this for so many years. And I was it was my bucket list thing. So, of course, I messed it up in the first 30 seconds. So my um, my mask was foggy, but I went down and I couldn't see what was in front of me. So I kind of lifted my mask off my face. And I was right next to a huge whale mouth. And I, if um, if you can't see me like exaggerating my hands, it's about two or three feet, three or three, three feet at least wide. And it kind of opens its mouth and it's feeding on this plankton that's growing in Baja. And so... I did have the presence of mind to have my guide carrying my camera. I put my a special um, case on my iPhone and with a stick, and he was carrying that because I couldn't have uh, videoed and seen this for myself. I would have just been too nervous. So he was videoing, and me and my group members, because I did go with a, a little retreat, a wildlife retreat, and um, so my my guests were with me, and he videoed all of us, and it was just amazing. This creature is giant and very gentle um it's just eating the plankton and it's got these beautiful little dots on its body and the ridges and you were so close you could see everything it was the most amazing experience of my life um so i i would urge every, anyone it's so close if you're in the united states it's so close um to go down there and do it um so definitely would recommend it. and there's lots of places all over the world you can do it not just baja but I like it there because they're they're focusing on eating the plankton, so you don't have to like chase them, and like, you don't have to like swim fast to be able to you know catch up with them. Um, so it was a great experience. That is incredible. I got to swim with them at the Georgia Aquarium, and I imagine it's totally different out in nature and so much more incredible. Uh huh. Yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. And there's a slow swimmer, but they're so big. And that tail is so powerful that they are fast. Yeah. Yeah. I've had friends that swam with them, I believe in Tahiti, and they had to swim fast to catch up um, so that they could really spend time with it and see it. But in Baja, no, they're just sitting in there eating the plankton. 
Um, so it's a really nice place to, to be able to see them in nature. That's really nice that they regulate it too and make sure that, you know, there's not too many boats and everything in there. Yeah, it's very important when you're interacting with wildlife to do it in the the most, um, the least obtrusive way um, so that the, that they can continue nature and that we're not bothering them. Mm -hmm. And you run a travel company. Can you tell us a little bit about that and why you got started? Yeah, we started our company 25 years ago, my husband and I. We had just traveled to Peru, which was a bucket list item for me. And when I met him, he's Peruvian. And um, I told him I've always wanted to go to Machu Picchu. And a lot of people from Lima don't actually, back in those days, didn't actually travel a lot around Peru. So he hadn't been either. So we went and it was a great time. And when we were starting a business, you know, he said, I think we could do this for clients. You know, not a lot of companies are doing it. Um, I think we can put packages together um, so pe people can come to Peru and see what there is to offer in Peru. Um, so we spent a couple of years just traveling around Peru, getting to know the Amazon, the desert, the Andes, um, all the different places that they have to offer there and the food and the people. Um, so we started with Peru and then we, we expanded to South America. And so what we do is a client will come to me and say, Monica, I want to go to Vietnam, for example. And so I do everything for them. I do the airfare, the hotels, all the transfers all the experiences, um, you know, we do a lot of cooking classes, you know, um, get them out with locals, um, you know, any anything logistical, uh, tour guides, drivers, um, you know, we went, we go and inspect all the hotels. So we find the hotels that are, have the most local charm, well-located, really great service. Uh, most of our clients are upscale. So um, you know, we need to, we need it to be really good service for them. Um, and so that's what I do. I just plan trips for people all over the world. Um, because every year we've added several countries. So now we sell at 70 countries. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. And you scout everything out. So you, yes. So you must love to travel yourself. Yes. I'm always traveling. It's, it's really hard to pin me down to sit still for a while. <laughs> I'm always going, going, going. And then taking care of clients. So it's it's a busy life, but I like it. I like life to be busy. Yeah, it's great like that. So the name Yampu Tours, where where did that come from? So when we started the company, we named ourselves Contiki after the Thor Hedradial book about a raft, but that went um between uh Peru and Easter Island and Thor Hedradial was trying to establish a connection between um, the, the people of Easter Island, the people of South America, and even the people of Asia. So, um, and the raft that he used was made of reed, which is a plant that grows in the highest navigable lake in the world, Lake Titicaca, which is between Peru and Bolivia. And we actually went up to Lake Titicaca and met the men who built the raft for the expedition. Um, they were alive back then. And um, so that boat in the Quechua language, which is the um, the Andean people of Peru, um, is called Yampu. And so, yeah, so in, in, in 2000 and I can't remember eight or nine, we changed, we, we changed our marketing name to Yampu because people were getting us confused. There were too many Contikis in the world. Like a lot of companies are named Contiki. So, um, we're the only Yampu company. So that's good. Oh, that is good. You've got a story about forest bathing in Japan, don't you? Yes. Um, so uh, Japan has am amazing, incredible temples all over the country, dotted everywhere. And um, so I went to uh, one of the temples in, um, well, I went to one in um, Kyoto. I went to one near uh, Mount Fuji. Um, and these are off the beaten track temples, not as many tourists there. And one of the things that they do in Japan, it's called forest bathing. And basically it's a walk in the forest, walk in the tree, you know? And forest bathing is really good for bringing down your stress hormones, 
lowering your heart rate. Um, it, it, you know, you go out in the woods and you breathe deeply and you're going to reduce your stress. Um, you know, you're, you'll be recovering quicker. It helps with your happiness hormone. Um, and, and weirdly, when I was a kid, when I would get upset, and, you know, at, you know, at my parents or at my roommates in college, I would go for a walk in the, the woods, you know, for me, that was just kind of innate. It just sort of came to me. Um, so I was really ex excited to learn in Japan that that is a, an actual thing that they use to control their stress, um, to help with depression, um, and, and you know, an overall well-being. Um, I also had done a boys' trip for some very um, successful men, and they go in their accountability groups on these amazing trips that I plan for them. And I always have to try to plan things that are different that they haven't done before. And they've done everything. So it's always a challenge. Um, so one of the things that I did for them when they went to Japan is I sent, I set them up with a Shinto priest and we dressed them all up in the white robes that the Shinto priests wear. And they went to a really cold waterfall and they did this thing called Takigo, Takigyo. It's also called misogi, and it's it's a, a meditation under a very cold waterfall. I believe the waterfall was about forty degrees. Ooh! So the Shinto priest showed them how to do it, and they all went under this waterfall and they did this meditation. And these guys, who are masters of the universe that have everything, came back to me and said, "Monica, that was the best experience of my life." You know. And so um, that was really incredible for me um, to hear that kind of feedback. And I just think it's so amazing, all of these things that, that I've learned in Japan, um, because they are a quite um, humble society. Um, they're, they're pretty serious, um, but they have all these amazing things that we can incorporate it so easily into our life, you know, like... Um, cold water plunge everybody's doing that now right yeah and, yeah or walking in the woods you know um so easy but so beneficial I'd much rather just walk in the woods than do the <laughs> cold bath <Yeah>. oh, God. <laughs> and that's incredible that they said that was the best experience to yeah. you're in cold water and your natural reaction is to shiver and stuff but they they loved it yeah, it was something completely different. They learned something. These these guys like to learn things wherever they go, you know. Um, and the whole setup with the the um the Shinto priest who was teaching them and they were all dressed in white and um and then going under a really cold waterfall and being able to meditate, that's very powerful. Why do you feel that travel brings peace to the world? Before I traveled the world, I I was in my own little tunnel and didn't really understand people that were different than me, you know? Um, and so if everybody was to go out and travel and go to different places and meet people that are completely different from you, uh, socioeconomically, culturally, religiously, um, and spend some time with those people you become to you you start to learn about the similarities of people from all different religions and cultures to to yourself um you uh begin to trust in people in the world um because for me you know having been all over the world 99.9% .9 of my interactions with people have been really positive you know of course occasionally you'll meet somebody rude I usually do that right here at home <laughs> <laughs> the rude people always seem to be right at home right but maybe that's because you're in your daily life and you're not when you're traveling you have a certain kind of happiness mm. that you bring to the table you know you're not stressed you're not in a hurry. Um, you are there to learn. You're there to see. You're there for a surprise of whatever's going to happen for that day. Where when you're in your regular life, you may be late. You may be stressed. You may, you know, and I think that 
um, that also makes people, you know, respond that way to you. Even if you don't do anything, you know, even if you're just standing there minding your own business, but you're stressed that it's contagious, that stress, that stress feeling. So um, when you're traveling, you're happy. And so you usually meet happy people. And, um, and so that for me, I just feel like I've learned so much about the world and I've become so much more open-minded and so much more respectful of different cultures and um, different religions that are different than mine. Um, and so I do think that every if everybody had these kind of experiences that I've been able to have in my lucky uh, career, um, that, that, the, that the world would be a more peaceful place because people would just love each other more. Absolutely. And I loved earlier, you said that you talk to the locals and you find places with local charm and you know, as I'm a diver and I talk to the local dive crew and they always point me in the, you know, this is the local spot. This isn't the touristy mm -hmm. spot. And those are, those are the places where you really get a feel for, for what that area is like. So that a lot of respect to you for, you know, cause anybody could just Google and be like, Oh, you know, go to this tourist spot. You're, you're doing the research and that it's got to help the locals too. Yes. Um, so I've always told my salespeople, like, for example, Peru, um, most people want to go to Peru because they want to see Machu Picchu. But I, I I say our goal is to have them come back and say, I love the people and I love the food, mm -hmm. you know, and I love all the nature that I saw. And um, and so, you know, we we I would ask them to put something into everybody's itinerary and everybody's budget is different. It could be a really you know, um, complicated experience, you know, where, um, you know, we've designed a picnic and we're doing a give back thing. And, you know, uh, you know, uh, one time uh, me and the kids went and built a garden for school, you know, so it could be something more complicated or it could, could be something just as simple as going to a, a market and meeting local vendors and trying different kinds of fruits and vegetables that, you know, that are different that coming from the Amazon, for example. Um, you know, and, and getting that kind of simple interaction, but, um, you know, get, you know, uh, learning to weave is another thing that I, I do with a lot of clients in Peru, you know, um, and they also learn about how these ladies make those beautiful, I don't know if you've ever seen like this, this, I don't know if this is going to be on. Yeah. On you got to go to the YouTube to see her beautiful shawl. <laughs> yes, this is. So this is Peruvian, it's alpaca, and it's, it's uh, if you're not on YouTube, it's a beautiful orangey red color. And so they taught us how they use different plants um, and seeds uh, to make the dye um, that they use for all the beautiful colors of that you'll see in Peru and all the, the weavings, you know. And uh, so we got to see how they, what, what they use to make the colors, how they make the colors stick. I'll leave that. I'll, I'll leave that for when you go. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then how to use the equipment that they use, the, the looms that they move, use to weave and, and that kind of thing is very fun and exciting. And um, the people that are showing you, you get to know their personality and they're usually really sweet and, and, you know, um, sometimes you are at their home. Um, you know, I've been at people's homes and seen their little guinea pigs running around. One time we went to somebody's home and their llama had just died. That was a sad day. Um, and everybody was really sad because their llama had just died, but that's real. That's life. Not everything is beautiful, you know? Um, but it's real and it's nice and it's a great way to get to get to know a country by really getting to know the people. Yeah. Now you were talking a little bit about nature and I live in Ohio. There's not very much outside that's going to hurt me. If I go to the Amazon or Africa, you know, you got to be prepared. So how important is a tour guide when you're in these areas? Oh, a tour guide is a must. And, um, and in Africa, um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can have one wildlife guide that travels with you the whole time and you go from place to place by car, or you can do a flying safari and you might fly into a, on a small plane 
into like a little strip and then you go to your tented camp and then they have their local guides that live on the camp that know basically know the prides of lions they know where the cheetahs are um so uh and when you check in to one of these uh one of these safari lodges uh the manager will sit down with you and he'll give you the rules and every safari tented camp that i've been to has different rules um so for example one time we were in the serengeti and they said you can sit on this rock but don't sit on any of the other rocks because the snakes like them because it gets cold at night and the snakes and then the sun warms the rocks and the snakes like to go up on the rock um they said things like you walk on this path don't walk off the path um you can walk alone in the day but in the night you need a, a, a maasai warrior to walk with you you know um so uh you know and then at one camp i don't know if it was the same one but i remember and, and the, this happens with a lot of camps because usually your tents are kind of spread out over the property and a lot of times they didn't, most of the time they don't have a phone in your tent so if you need something in the night you gotta put your flashlight up to the little window and flash it and somebody will come um so you don't actually you know leave your tent at night ever um and so I've had things like, I've had like a, a cape buffalo rubbing up against my tent all night. And, and I didn't know what it was. And I don't dare go outside, <laughs> you know. So the next morning, they were like, yeah, there was a, a you know, a cape buffalo rubbing up against your tent last night, cool. you know. Um, at one time, so at this, at the lodge where the, uh, the they warned us about the snakes, um my kids were walking along and they a snake did go across the path in front of them and my kids were uh like 12 and 15, like 13 and 15 and so um, you would think they would know better um and so instead of like running back like I would have done <laughs> and like I did <laughs> they went closer to see what it was and Sounds like my 15 year old and what he would do. Yep. Yeah. It was, uh, I, I went to ask the manager and they're like, that's a spitting cobra. So, <sighs> you know, um, my advice is, you know, even if your kids are teenagers or even if they're 20, like they have them right next to you, you know, mm -hmm. um, when you're walking around a safari camp. Um, so yeah, it's really important to like, listen to the managers, like, one of the things you got to do when you're on in a safari um, is usually have like an open vehicle and you never put your hands out of the vehicle or stand. Like if you stand up, you should probably ask, but can I stand here? Um, because the animals are very used to the vehicle, but when something comes out, that's not normal and that will startle them, you know? um so that's one of the things but every time you're at a different lodge they'll tell you everything you need to know you know um to keep you safe and the guides are amazing because they will track the animals they'll know they'll they'll they have stories about the animals um a lot of knowledge um one time in that same lodge in serengeti where we were that our guide was one of the ones that is went with us all over the country so he wasn't the one from the safari lodge and so it was his first time and i thought maybe we were at a disadvantage because he had been to this camp before and maybe he wouldn't be able to find the animals and i we were out in this vast plain and i was looking around and i didn't see anything and 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 we were sitting our truck was sitting by a, a water hole and I was thinking, oh, there's nothing out there. And he's like, there's some, there's some cheetahs coming. And I'm looking and I don't see anything. Um, and, you know, uh, just, you know, maybe doubting him a little bit. <laughs> um, and then suddenly, like a minute or two later, a family of like six cheetahs come out <laughs> and come right up to our truck because we were parked right by the water hole. So we were sitting feet from them and they were drinking and they were playing and they were like cuddling and hopping all over each other because some of them were babies. Oh. And it was it was an amazing experience. Um, it, you know, you can't do that kind of stuff alone. First of all, it would be dangerous. And mm -hmm. second of all, 
and you wouldn't know anything was coming. You wouldn't know where to park. You wouldn't know, you know. So a good guide is always really great. And um, and I kudos to my guide. He was amazing. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And you brought up your kids and traveling with them. Do they enjoy getting into nature? Yes, yes. My whole family loves nature. Yeah, my son's done a lot of trekking. Um, he did. Um, he actually became a marine and um, has done a lot of adventurous things. My daughter makes a, uh, makes it a point to go on a trip every year to somewhere new. And she's exploring it in a new way now, because when we used to take them to travel, everything was done for us. You didn't have to think at all. And now she's traveling like in a backpack and, you know, having to figure everything out for herself. And uh, that's made for a few funny stories, too. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that for another day. <laughs> How do you like to give back when you travel? So um, one thing that you can do when you travel is there's a website called um, uh, uh, Pack for a Purpose. And so you can take a suitcase full of stuff um, that if you go on the Pack for the Purpose website, it will tell you like at this hotel, who they work with and what. With, so, for example, a lot of times they'll work with a school or an orphanage, you know. And what, or maybe a medical center, and what that that um, uh, that charity that they're supporting, what do they need? Okay, so maybe they, if it's a school, for example, they need pencils, they need erasers and sharpeners and notebooks and calculators, you know, and it will give you like a full list of what the kids actually need, and you can fill a suitcase up with all the things that the people need and then you give it to the hotel when you get there and they give it to their their charity and then um you have a whole empty suitcase for shopping <laughs> <laughs> it makes everybody happy <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> yeah so that's one way to do it um you know i've created things for some clients you know i had clients who went and this was really nice because the same group of guys that went to Japan, they went to Chile with me and we, they built a house um, for a family that, that needed a home. And this was right before COVID, like two or three months before COVID started, you know, and that just like kept me warm all of COVID thinking there's a family that has a home because of my clients, you know, wow. um, that's safe and, and nice. So um, and, um, so, so we have done things for our clients where we have developed a program, um, for them. Um, and so, you know, and my daughter went to Zambia and she, um, she worked in a school and she taught these kids at a school and then, it, and she also worked at an after school, um, program where kids would come over and get help with their homework from them. Um, and, and have some like nice snacks and a safe place to be after school. Um, so she's done things like that. Um, so it, almost every country is different, but, um, you know, if you're working with a company like Yampu or another uh, travel advisor, they usually have really great ways to help you. And, and do, do take note of that Pack for a Purpose website because they have amazing uh, ideas there. I'll link your website and also pack for a purpose in the description notes so people can check that out. Yeah. And if somebody wanted to book a, a travel adventure, let's call it with you, how long does that process take? Well, um, I've had people call me up that are leaving in two or three weeks and I get it, get it together for them. You know, um, usually it does take me a couple of weeks from the first conversation with the client to um, to organize all the activities and and all the hotels and everything that they need and make it happen. Um, and many of our clients book up to more than a year in advance. Okay. And, um, and that's really great because we have more time and um, we have more availability, better flight connections. 
Um, you know, so booking early is always really great, but I mean, I can make it happen in a couple of weeks also. <laughs> awesome. And how can people find you? My website is, um, uh, Yampu, Y A M like Mary P U.com. Um, and, uh, I'm Monica Rowski. I'm also in, um, uh, Instagram under Monica Rowski experiences. And our phone number is 213-418-9191. Perfect. And before we go, what is one tip that you have for someone who would like to connect with nature? Um, you know, almost anywhere in the world, you can find a park or uh, a beach or, um, you know, uh, a forest, you know, um, in the United States, you can get a pass um, for the national parks um, and you can get, a, I think, a lifetime pass or a yearly pass. Um, it's about $80. And that's really incredible um, to do that. Go go to your go to your national parks and your state parks, and uh, or just like your community park, you know, and walk around and breathe. Sit down and breathe. Um, you know, big breath. Uh, oh, just like open your eyes and look at everything. Look at the knots and the trees and the flowers and you know the if there's a stream. That's really good to sit about down by a stream and just listen to the water flowing. Um, you know, that's really, really good. And the, I think that it doesn't have to be overthought. Everyone can get out into nature. There's, um, you know, most people do live somewhere near at least a park and, um, and, you know, make it part of your habits and do it as often as you can, even on vacations, you know, go, go, uh, to as many natural uh, things as you can visit volcanoes, visit waterfalls, visit parks and beaches and uh, mountains and trails, you know, I do a little hiking. And my one thing about hiking is get shoot really good shoes, you know, uh, with a lot of tread. Cause even the other day I fell down because I had these tennis shoes with no tread. So yeah. Yeah. Good hiking shoes. <laughs> That's important. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And until next time, get outside and see what develops. Thanks for joining Wild Development Studio. We hope this exploration into the world of wildlife arts and adventure has sparked a desire to get outside and connect with something wild. If you have an adventure that's awe-inspiring, don't hesitate to share. Click the link in the description to submit your story to have it featured on our show or be a guest. Until next time, keep connecting to the wild and see what develops. The views, opinions, and statements expressed by individuals during Wild Development Studio Productions do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Wild Development Studio or its affiliates. Participation in any activities, expeditions, or adventures discussed or promoted during our content may involve inherent risks. It is strongly advised that individuals conduct thorough research, seek professional guidance, and take all necessary precautions before engaging in any such activities. Wild Development Studio, its representatives, or employees shall not be held responsible for any injury, loss, damage, accident, or unforeseen incident that may occur as a result of participating in activities inspired by or discussed in our content. By choosing to engage with our content or act upon any information provided, individuals do so at their own risk and discretion.